Question seven. Ten marks for this one, so it's a big one, which is good to know. Uh, table of fatty acids and melting points is shown below, so we've got fatty acids and melting points. Uh, just knowing that we're dealing with melting points of fatty acids, I know I'm thinking about carbon to carbon double bonds. I'm also thinking about carbon chain size. So therefore, with reference to their structure and bonding, explain the difference in melting points between these few fatty acids. So I'm going to go to my data booklet. Let's find our fatty acids. Uh, they're not there. I always find these ones hard to find. Probably should look at the index, really, shouldn't I? Um, there they are. Here are my fatty acids. So, first one here is palmitic. Palmitic acid is uh, a 15C15, and it has no double bonds. So, steric acid is here, which is a C17, and no double bonds. Oleic acid is a C17 and one C to C bond. And then linoleic acid um, is C17 and through, hang on, C17 and two double bonds. Uh, got to be really careful with these two here. They look very similar. Uh, one's got two double bonds, one's got three double bonds. It's got to be careful looking at that. So now we have the data here that's winning a reference, um, which is the bonding and structure, basically. Palmitic acid and steric acid. So just looking at this, you can see steric acid has a higher melting point than palmitic acid. Um, and looking at it, that's due to the fact that palmitic acid is shorter. So therefore, what we're going to say is the difference here is the fact that um, steric acid has a higher uh, melting point than uh, palmitic acid. That's pretty much going to be stating it. I'm going to say why this is due to steric acid being a larger molecule, molecule um, slash longer carbon chain. This increase, um, therefore, it has stronger dispersion forces holding the molecules together. So therefore, that's key when you're talking about structure and bonding. You've got to think about the intermolecular forces or the intermolecular bonds there. And because you're looking at um, all these guys here, you're really talking about the dispersion forces holding them together. That's the main one that's going to be um, happening with your fatty acids there. So clearly, two dot points. This can also be broken into two dot points as well, really. There's an extra one here, just in case. All right, and it's all correct. Um, we've stated what's happened, what the difference is, and then we've talked about why that difference is, both in the structure, because it's a longer cha chain, and therefore also the bonding, because of the dispersion forces, are bigger because of the longer chain. Next one, steric acid and linoleic acid. So therefore, we've got both the same carbon chain length, but the difference here is the fact that this one has no double bonds, between carbons, and this one has two double bonds between carbons. So therefore, again, I'm going to say that um, steric acid has a higher, higher melting point than uh, linoleic acid. And here I'll explain to do with the uh, structure. We have um, steric acid acid contains no carbon to carbon double bonds. Important that you don't just say double bonds here because there are double bonds in the acid region. Um, so therefore, uh, you know to talk about carbon to carbon double bonds only in this area. Double bonds, but linoleic acid has two carbon to carbon double bonds. Bonds. I'm running out of room here, but I need to also talk about one thing that that does. All right, the 
carbon to carbon double bonds, create kinks in the structure and therefore the chains do not stack together as well, reducing the strength of the, I'll say intermolecular forces here, molecular forces. This really is dispersion forces, but to be fair, we, we, if we talk about intermolecular forces, it covers all of them. Um, because realistically there is a bit of hydrogen bonding going on um, and dipole-dipole there. But definitely um, the key thing here is the double bonds and the fact that the double bonds create kinks in the structure. Obviously when we have this situation happening, all right, they're straight chains, they can, oh, you can't see that. When we have just single bonds, um, we've got just a nice straight chain there. As soon as you chuck in some double bonds, you end up with random um, shapes forming and this area here makes it not able to stack together. So therefore, because they can't stack close together, the dispersion forces aren't as strong and can be overcome a lot easier. So therefore you end up with a much lower melting point when you have carbon to carbon double bonds in your molecule. So that's those two answered and explained. Moving on to part B. A particular triglyceride found in beef um, Compound A contains three fatty acid chains, palmitic, steric, and oleic. Uh, compound A undergoes hydrolysis within the human body. Um, so basically this is going to be what happens when your fats break down. And knowing that we have three different um, fatty acids here, we need to, I'm guessing we have to draw the full triglyceride, but let's have a look at it. What is compound A? This is our full triglyceride. And these here are our fatty acids. So we need to know what's gonna happen here. Um, a triglyceride has three ester groups. Um, that's not drawn really well, but you can still see what I'm doing there, hopefully. Um, the first one, this, this part here of our molecule, this creates our ester group here. So basically what's gonna happen is I've put in that carbon already, which is this carbon here. Then I'm just gonna simply put in what the fatty acid tail is, which is C15. H31. And the next one is going to be C17, H35. The next one will be C17, H33. Um, so therefore we've got, this is a carbon here, it's not very really clear. I'm going to go over here and make them a bit clearer to see. Uh, that's a double one to oxygen. That's a carbon, that's a double bond to oxygen. So you can see clearly see our ester groups here anyway, um, and then going into our residues. Probably could have put a bond between this carbon and this carbon, might have made it a bit clearer as well, but that's good enough for my structure of my triglyceride. Write the formula for compound B and its correct stoichiometric ratio here. Uh, what we're going to know is this is a hydrolysis reaction. We're gonna be breaking up these ester bonds, so therefore it's gonna be hydrolyzed by not H3O plus, not hydronium, it's going to be hydrolyzed by water. And we're going to have three waters as well because it asks for the correct stoichiometric ratio in that box there. So therefore that's our um, compound B because we're doing hydrolysis of these. Part um, three is draw the semi-structure for this molecule here. So obviously after our hydrolysis, we've got our fatty acids over this side. This will be our glycerol. So keeping in the same system that we have for this, you're gonna end up with our backbone of glycerol and then O to H, O to H, O to H. There, and that's our glycerol. Done! Which is really cool. Um, moving on, lipase and colipase work together to catalyze the reaction in part B. Describe how enzymes and coenzymes interact to catalyze a reaction. All right, this was where we need to think about what a coenzyme actually does. Well, what an enzyme does. An enzyme has an active site, and that's what allows the reaction to happen. Sometimes the enzyme's active site is not actually active until a coenzyme attaches to it 
or does something to make it active. So this is what I'm going to be talking about here. Two marks, two dot points. I'm going to say that a coenzyme, coenzyme attaches to the enzyme to change the shape of the active site to allow the substrate, let's keep substrate, uh, to bond with it. That's one way a coenzyme can happen, can do it. They can actually change the active site to actually allow it to bond. The other way that a coenzyme can work is coenzymes enzymes can also act as electron donors, donors or um, carriers, sometimes they're called carriers, to allow the enzyme to function. Okay, so that's basically what they, they do. They participate in an enzyme kind of function, whereas they give an electron to the substrate to do its business, and then they at the end of it, they get the electron back. Um, so therefore, they're unchanged, which makes them a coenzyme there. Um, one other thing we can also add is what catalyzed means is um, catalysts work to um, provide a, probably not work to, just provide a lower activation energy through an alternative reaction pathway. Um, and that's again just me talking about anything I know about enzymes. Every time I see enzyme, I start to talk about active site and the substrate bonding to the active site. Coenzymes, I'll talk about changing shape and the fact that they also can do enzyme donors. Anytime I see catalyst, I'm going to talk about this idea of a, an alternative reaction pathway with a lower activation energy, just to try and hit all the marks that I could possibly get with that. Um, I've got three dot points for two marks, um, but hopefully within that, there should be at least two marks worth of um, stuff. So that's question seven, um, done and dusted. Question eight coming up next.